Honestly, I can think of nothing worse than reading my own writing out loud to people. Whether it's people that I know or people that I don't know, it still sounds terrible. And yet. My third book, You've Got Chainmail, is now out in the world, which is fantastic. And Pub Week was incredible and I felt very, very celebrated. I had the most amazing book launch party on Saturday. It turns out you cannot escape doing a reading at your own book launch party. Am I happy about that? No, I am not. But I decided to obviously extend my torment and put it here on YouTube because why not? So most of this video is going to be the reading from You've Got Chainmail as well as me answering some audience questions. I have cut out a couple of questions for the simple fact that I may have told the people in attendance about something that's not officially been announced yet. So I've had to cut that part out, but I've left everything else in, including some questions that you might find really helpful. And of course the dreaded reading. It was so hot in the bookshop. So if I'm like constantly touching my head, that is why I'm like wiping sweat away. I was absolutely breaking it. I even mess up at one point, but I wanted to share it with you anyway, because this community has been so incredible to have over the last couple of years and I hope you enjoy it. And that's it. That's all the preamble I'm going to do uh, over to past Sam, who is sweating her ass off in a bookshop. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, this is my third book, but my first book that I am properly launching into the world. So really happy to have you all here. Um, I'm surprised and flattered to see people that I don't know here. So thank you. Um, welcome. So uh, I have been, uh, my arm has been twisted into doing a reading. So I will do a reading, not a spicy one, despite Aww. what the peanut gallery seems to be demanding. Um, and then I can answer any questions that you guys have. Please help yourself to snacks and drinks. Uh, lovely lemon meringue pie has just been brought. So there is that over there if you'd like some. Um, but otherwise I will, I will start. So if you aren't familiar, this is the book. It's called You've Got Chainmail. It came out in paperback on Thursday and in ebook and audio on Tuesday. Um, and it's published by One More Chapter, which is a division of HarperCollins UK. And I'm going to do a reading now. I don't know how much context I should provide for the reading because it's going to be from a good way into the book, but um, our two main characters, our point of view characters are Jack and Morgan. Um, and this, this section is Jack speaking to a couple of his friends and to his little sister um, who he has just helped move home. So by the time we got home, Phil and Chloe were ready for us. I'd canceled our Friday night plans when Amy had texted, but when I'd uncanceled them before the drive home, they'd pulled through big time. Phil handed us both ice cold beers as soon as we walked in where we found a spread of hot pizzas waiting on the kitchen island and a rom-com queued up on the TV. Good to see you, Ames, Chloe said, wrapping her in a hug. Important question first, meat lovers or veggie? Veggie, please, Amy said, cupping her hands in front of her and jutting out her lower lip, looking like Oliver Twist. Chloe plopped a plate with two slices of veggie lovers pizza into her hands. When we'd been growing up, I'd hated how Amy tried to wriggle her way into my little friend group. She and I had been close, but it always annoyed me when she tried to hang out with my friends. But the older I'd got, the more I'd appreciated that they were close too. And when I got back from traveling and realized that they'd been keeping up with her just as much whilst I'd been away, it had given me a newfound appreciation for them, all three of them. Still though, there were times when I began to regret how integrated they were. Like when we were done with our pizza and halfway through the crappy Netflix rom-com, the four of us squished together on the sofa and Chloe started pestering me about Morgan. I hear kayaking went well, Chloe said, her voice suggestive. Yeah, it did, I said, trying to be as matter of fact, nothing to see here as possible. Wait, how do you know about that? Chloe shrugged. I may have seen a sketch of a kayak over her shoulder on her lunch break on Monday, so I asked her. You took her kayaking? Amy asked, balking at me. You wouldn't even teach me to kayak. That's not true, I countered. I'm the one who did teach you. Only because dad made you, she said. You said it was your happy time and teaching a newbie would just ruin it for you. I cringed. I actually had said that. I remembered it perfectly, and I'd meant it, too. I don't know, I said, trying to come up with an explanation for the three sets of prying eyes staring at me. I just felt like she needed to experience it. She's trying to be more adventurous this summer. Not one, not two, but all three of them smirked suggestively at that. Fuck all of you, I said, sitting back and taking a long swig of my beer. Now that would be adventurous, Phil said, but sadly illegal in Amy's case, so let's keep it family-friendly, shall we? I rolled my eyes, a million other expletives running through my mind, but I was sure any of them could be twisted against me, so I kept my mouth shut. It's nice that the two of you are spending so much time together, Chloe continued. I don't think she's got any local friends other than us since Carr left. We've hung out literally twice, I said, clearly too defensively, because Amy tilted her chin down to look up at me skeptically. 
Who is this Morgan person? Why haven't I met her if she's so important that you've hung out with her twice? Just someone from our D&D game, I said, racking my brain for a change of subject, but not coming up with one quickly enough. Someone hot from our D&D game, Chloe said, but tragically straight, otherwise she would have succumbed to my charms first. Definitely cute, Phil agreed, and I'm making her chainmail armor, which is awesome. Amy looked at me as if for confirmation of Morgan's attractiveness, but even as I pictured just how true that claim was, I just shrugged. I wouldn't give Chloe the satisfaction, though I'd spent far too much time these past weeks admiring and imagining Morgan to deny it if pressed. What are her big three? Amy asked, wisely directing that question to Chloe. I don't know about Moon and Rising, she said, but she's definitely a Sagittarius. Her birthday was the same day as the work Christmas party last year. Ooh, a Sag. Interesting choice for a Pisces. Yes, because we're nothing more than our birth charts, I said, rolling my eyes, and everything is preordained. Tell me a wise one. When are my stars next to line with hers? Well, I'd like to meet this Morgan, Amy said, completely ignoring me. If she can worm her way under the surface enough for Jack to take her kayaking, I suspect she's worth getting to know. You can come to one of our games, Chloe offered. I'm sure Fatima wouldn't mind. Amy pulled a face. I still don't get what you guys do in those games. It sounds kinky, all those dungeons and chains. It's chain mail, Phil said, and honestly, we've spent tragically little time in dungeons. <laughs> we literally just escaped a dungeon, Chloe said, but Phil waved her off. That was the catacombs, he said dismissively, just a glorified basement, hardly a classic dungeoneering opportunity. Nerds, Amy said through a poorly faked cough, then turned back to me. So tell me about you and Morgan. When are you seeing her again? Chloe and Phil looked over at me, too. I'd never talked about Morgan with them, so they were getting this hot off the press, too. Next weekend, I said, really, anything for an appropriate change of, sub change of subject. And what are you doing next weekend? Amy asked, drawing out her words like she was trying to draw the information out of me. I don't actually know yet, I said. It was sort of a lie. I had an idea, but I hadn't fully decided yet. I'm sorry, you know you're seeing her, but you don't know what your plans are? Amy asked. That sounds like a date if I've ever heard one. I scoffed. How can it sound like a date if we don't actually have anything planned yet? Amy sighed and turned towards me, explaining as if I were a child. When you have friends, you say, hey, do you want to do this thing? And then you make plans around the activity. But when you're seeing someone, you say, I'd like to see you again. And then you make plans around the timing. Yes, Chloe said, that's absolutely right. I don't know, Phil said. I feel like sometimes we just pick days and then make plans around it. Exactly, I said, especially because I'm trying to help her try all these new things. Oh, we don't count, Chloe said, waving Phil off. We're basically family. Amy's definitely right. She turned her attention fully to me. When you asked her to hang out for the day, and I'm assuming you asked her because I heard you ask her to go kayaking too, were you asking her because you were thinking we need to do more of these silly adventures and I'm free at this time, or were you thinking I want to see Morgan again? I scowled at her, then took a deep breath and leaned my head back against the sofa. I thought about how I could answer that would contradict what she'd said, but I couldn't, because not only would I have sounded hella defensive, but she was right. Fine, I said, sitting up suddenly enough that I spilled a bit of beer on my leg. I wanted to spend more time with her. Can we not make a big deal out of it? I'm freaked out enough about it on my own as it is. I looked up at the three of them who were all staring at me wide-eyed. Sure, Phil said. Sorry, mate. Yeah, no big deal, Amy agreed. Chloe just nodded. Thank you, I said, grabbing the remote from the coffee table and turning up the volume on the TV. Now can we please just watch Meg Ryan flirt with Tom Hanks? But as a little boy in the film spelled out F-O-X over and over, I descended into a spiral over whether Morgan thought next weekend was a date, too. And if she did, how she felt about that. Yeah. So, hopefully that was <laughs> uh, contextualized enough. Sorry to pull from the very middle of the book. But, um, yeah, I've been told that if there are any questions, now is a good time to answer those. So... Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I play, um, Dungeons and Dragons, um, with a lot of people here, just <laughs> TTRPGs in general, um, uh, the nerds that are dressed up in the back and, uh, the surrounding, <laughs> um, and I'd always wanted to write, like, a and d rom-com, and I mentioned it to my publisher, years ago um, when I was working on an earlier book and they kind of filed the idea away and then this sort of timing was right recently that we sort of combined a couple of different ideas and they wanted to write one that included a Ren Fair and I wanted to write the Dungeons and Dragons one. Helpfully people that are into Ren Fairs are also usually the people that are into things like D&D so um, it worked naturally to kind of combine those ideas into a story so it was something that um, I'd kind of been thinking about in the back of my mind for a while, but it, my publisher and I worked together to sort of decide what we wanted the story to look like from there. So. 
Yes, <laughs> Lena, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. Um, I started writing this book on the 1st of September 2023, so less than a year ago. And so it was a very, very different process to like a typical writing a debut process because I discussed the idea with my publisher. We agreed on it. We looked at an outline together and then we sort of went from there. Whereas, you know, typically an author will have a book done before starting to talk to someone about publishing it. So um, yeah, very different. I worked <laughs> very full on for a few months to get it done. Um, Ian and Vicky here in my writing group, I could probably attest to how many sprints I was on during that time. Um, and yeah, it was a really quick turnaround for this one, but it's not really that abnormal of a timeline for career authors who are putting out a book a year. Um, that means you're having to write and edit a book a year, which is, you know, takes a lot of time. So, um, but doing that on top of a day job was uh, challenging to say the least. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Um, did you feel that um, you had a challenge with leading people into the subject matter because they don't know PWD? Yeah, I did, especially because my editor is like not into gaming or geek culture or anything like that at all. And so, um, she was sort of my barometer for like, is this too, is this too nerdy? Cause at the end of the day, this is a romance novel. It's not lit RPG. It's not a fantasy novel though. You won't know it from the reading I just did, but there are actually fantasy sections in the book. So their D and D game that they're playing is written out as fantasy in really short scenes in between some of the chapters. Um, but it's not any of those things. It is a romance. And so ultimately it needs to appeal to people who like romance who may or may not have familiarity with those things so yeah it was a lot of that but honestly at the end of the day compared to a lot of you guys i am more of a, a noob in that you know that community and i don't know as much about ttrpgs and gaming as other people and so i do feel like i was maybe a good in-between person where i am passionate about those things and i do enjoy them but i also remember very clearly because it wasn't very long ago what it's like to be new to that and to need everything explained from scratch and to be Googling what does 5e mean and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. So how has the writing process affected by writing something that you're passionate about? Like, do you find it more difficult because... Yeah. Really yeah, I did. The accuracy was really important, not just because it was something I'm passionate about, but because, um, to put it kindly uh nerds can be picky about that kind of thing <laughs> and if you get something wrong then um they will notice and so it's even things like if you look on the cover like her sword is peace tied so it's got a piece of red string tied around it because when you go to a, a con or a festival or something like that and you have a fake weapon you have to have it peace tied so that it's like i'm not using this offensively um and like her surcoat on the cover is like hot pink. And I went back and forth with my editor about like, that is a historically inaccurate color for the cover of the novel. And so I ended up creating a reason in the book why her surcoat is hot pink because I needed it to make sense. Um, so there was a lot of that kind of thing. Um, additionally, we did have to do a little bit of dancing around um, Dungeons and Dragons as a concept because when they're talking about playing D and D, they can mention it and can mention the classes and things like that. But in the fantasy scenes, I had to make sure I wasn't using any copyrighted material. So locations, races, like there's a character in there who's uh, the race is a tiefling, which is a half demon, but tiefling is copyrighted by Wizards of the Coast, which is creator of Dungeons and Dragons. And so I had to just call her a half demon. <laughs> so it's things like that that had to be looked at. The HarperCollins legal team had to make sure that they were happy with how it was being handled, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yes, I like rangers. <laughs> um, I also quite like paladins Why? for playing. Um, I like bows. I like being doing physical damage, but um, not being a melee fighter. Like that's my preferred, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't want to get hurt. <laughs> I get very emotionally attached to my characters, as you well know. 
and um, yeah, I don't like them to get hurt. So I like to be in the back shooting arrows at things. Um, yeah, that's my favorite. Or be a paladin where I can be tanky enough to, to take it. Yeah. Who was your favorite character? And obviously, who was the most difficult to find the voice of? Uh, Jack was definitely the most difficult to find the voice of. Um, and what he looks like in the finished draft is very different than what he looked like in the first draft. Um, but I would say Morgan was the easiest for me to find the voice of because honestly, I felt like a lot of the voice was very similar to just my own natural voice in a way that characters I've written in the past haven't been. And I've had to, you know, detach myself a little bit more in the past and just make it someone other than me. Whereas I feel like there's more of me in Morgan um, than in other I guess FMCs I've written in the past. Um, but in terms of favorite character, I really like Amy, the little sister character that you just met in the reading. Um, I think she's she's my favorite. She doesn't play a huge role in this book, but she's fun. I like her. <laughs> um, uh, just bum and seat. I don't know. I it I just feel like if you. If you type words, it's a numbers game. If you type enough words, you'll start to figure out where you're going. And I think especially because when I was writing this book, I was doing so around a full-time job. And so I had such specific times that I was able to focus on writing. And so I would sit down to do it. And it's like, okay, I have to write something during this time. And so I would just do it. And maybe it was, you know, useful and ended up in the book. And maybe it wasn't, but I would write myself into what I was trying to achieve because just the imperative was there. And I think that forming that habit means that writer's block is less likely to be an issue. If I am ever feeling really blocked, then the, I don't know about like things I specifically do, but the thing not to do is to just like go watch TV or like turn my brain off or something, doing something like going for a walk or like um, I've recently taken up crochet and like just doing something with your hands that allows your mind to kind of wander. Um, that is nice if I'm feeling a little bit blocked, but having the consistent habit helps avoid that to begin with for the most part. It's not foolproof, but it, yeah, I don't experience it as badly, anywhere near as badly as I did before I kind of got better about that habit. Yeah. Um, I am interested in other genres. Um, Victoria is here, did my MA with me, and I was writing YA sci-fi at the time, and I would, you know, love to go back to that or something. Um, it's really funny, one of the reviews that's come in for this book already is like a three-star review, and the whole thing is just, can the author just write high fantasy next time? <laughs> I was like, this is clearly someone that was brought in by the fantasy elements. It was not a romance fan. Um, but anyway, um, yes, I would be interested in that, but I have a really good relationship with my publisher, and I have so many ideas for romances, and I know they, you know, will have a home for the most part that it's just a there's not enough hours in the day for me to really like explore other things and I'm really happy writing romance so yeah maybe one day I will go to another genre but um for now this is yeah I'm enjoying being here and it's nice to see as well like with this book that there is an appetite for like sort of crossover stuff so if I ever did want to explore another genre it might be that I'm able to do so still within the romance space <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that kind of thing is really um, successful. Like if you've got a real niche kind of subject like that, then that's the kind of thing publishers are interested in and pushing because there's not other stuff like that on the market or not as much other stuff like that on the market. Whereas the kind of romances that I wrote for my first two, you know, I like to think that people enjoyed them and that they're good, but there's a lot like that on the market. Whereas the more niche you go, the more sort of intersections you create, the less there will be that is the same. Yeah, um, I mean, I could give a lot of advice like as a fellow writer in terms of getting things done. I have a really different publishing journey than a lot of other authors. Um, I, I know my publisher, I worked at the publisher not for very long, I was an intern there years ago, but that is 
sort of how I got my deal. I'm unagented. So um, my advice is going to be very, you know, generic, like the secondhand advice that I've heard from other people. Uh, one of the best resources I think that I've seen for um, sort of the querying process and the process of getting published is a podcast called The Shit No One Tells You About Writing. And it's uh, an author and two agents from PS Literary Agency in the US and Canada. And they review query letters and they do interviews with authors all the time. It's a fantastic podcast. So that's a resource I would definitely recommend. Ian? So you're very good at and active on social media. Um, good at is subjective, but thank no, you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I posted a couple of videos in costume. Yeah, yeah. The more the more opportunities I get to put on costumes, the more uh, the more I'll post about that. So, um, my DM friends, more LARPs, please. <laughs> um, I'm going to Ren Fair in America in November, doing a big signing there. So, um, which is the Ren Fair that appears in the book that they go to. So, um, I'll have some some content from that. Um, cool. Any other questions? Um, excellent. I'm going to, just because I've got so many people here that I do know and, um, everything, I would like to just have two minutes to just thank a few people. Um, I hope everyone will tolerate that for a moment. Um, thank you so much to my friends who tolerated Deadline Mode Sam. Um, I know Deadline Mode Sam is um, even more autistic than normal Sam <laughs> in terms of being very direct and very brunt and uh, not always up for anything. But um, thank you for tolerating that. Thank you for being there when I, I crawled my way out of my uh, hibernation uh, for Deadline Mode. Um, you guys are very inspiring to me. Our relationships and our friendships are hugely inspiring to me. Shut up. Um, and a lot of people that read this book talk about the friend group and the relationships there as being part of what makes them love the book. And that wouldn't exist without you guys. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you to the couple of people that are here from my writing group. This book would not exist without Right Magic. Um, and yeah. Lifeline, absolute lifeline. Um, my husband is right there. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> the tall, the tall, handsome one. Um, he is the most supportive person on the planet. Like, cooks all the meals, does all the dog walks. Like, make sure that I'm, you know, breathing and caffeinated and <laughs> um, and all good when I am hunkering down for deadline mode. Just the most supportive person. So, thank you, my love. Um, and thank you to the Westbourne Bookshop team. This is really exciting. This is like my local indie bookshop. And so the fact that they were so enthusiastic to host us and to give me the opportunity to share this with you guys here tonight is everything. Thank you guys. Thank you to the team. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, there's plenty of snacks and drinks. Um, if anyone does want me to sign copies, I am happy to. I've brought some Sharpies, um, <laughs> but no pressure. Uh, help yourself to, to refreshments. And otherwise, yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs>